Hello there, thank you for staying with us and welcome to another edition of Channels Beam. I'm Victor Mathias. Now the introduction of cryptocurrency into the Nigerian economic system caught the attention of the regulators and other players who showed varying reactions. While the banking regulatory body was skeptical, others, including Vice President Yemi Oshibajo, accepted the new tender and pushed for its adoption by those who understood its workings. However, the CBN has made a U-turn and announced the plan to launch its own e-currency later this year. So today on the program, we will be looking at how this will have an impact on the economy and what its workings will be like. And to give us clarity as to how this will work, we have with us Uzoma Dozie. He is a banker, a tech investor, a financial inclusion advocate. He is the CEO and founder of Sparkle, a financial technology community and ecosystem. We also have with us Mobalaji Unibudo. He has over 18 years of experience in technology consulting and management project, project management. He is the founder and CEO of Zenbit, a decentralized exchange and financial services platform for remittances, payments, aid disbursements, store of value, and credits. Uh, it's a pleasure to have both of you on the program today. Um, but um, uh, Uzama kicks out the conversation for us. Um, so much has been going on in, you know, since the CBN uh, said it was going to m go ahead with the e-currency. But what was your initial reaction when you heard about this announcement? It was, uh, uh, thank you, Victor. Thanks for having me on the show. I mean, when I had this announcement, of course, I mean, like the move from cash to digital or electronic is always a good thing, especially and especially when your regulator is the one that's actually making those making those comments. Because automatic, I mean, like we've seen what the benefits of just uh, we've seen the benefits of a lot of businesses and um, organizations moving from really physical to to, the, uh, to electronic or digital ways of actually doing their business. So for us to now uh, for, for, for us to hear that from the regulator, it was great news. I mean, like, of course, then it is the questions are how is it going to be executed? What structure is going to be like? How many people are going to have access? Are we digital? I mean, do we have that digital infrastructure ready for people? Are people going to trust? I mean, these are all issues that, you know, like these are all issues that and questions that we're asking. But the, I think the best, the most important thing is that there's definitely some excitement that, you know, like our regulator is. I mean, by saying that, realizes the importance of moving from cash or electronic to, to digital and what the potential benefits and opportunities are for the Nigerian market and Nigerian space. Uh, so, so as it is, uh, Muzama, I mean, there's a lot uh, of uh, conversations around financial inclusion. Um, we haven't even gotten there yet with the physical Naira, I mean, in terms of uh, the unbanked now, so to speak. So how is this going to work, looking at the fact that we haven't even finished, you know, uh, banking people on the, on the physical Naira notes uh, system, uh, and then we're trying to move to the next level. Okay, and that's a very, very interesting question that you, you make. And you know, I would say, I would take a different view to this. I would say that there is a limit as to how you can include people financially using cash, physical cash and physical means. You know, we saw during the lockdown, the, you know, there's a good old adage, cash is king. But right now, I think it's cashless is king because in a lockdown where you can't move, and you can't move cash. So if you're paying for goods and services, how does the, 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 the provider of service get his cash? How does that farmer in the remote village get his cash when there's no, there's no, there's no movement? How does he pay for goods and services? How does, how does he, he can if it's cash? So I think what the central bank is also be, has realized is that there's a limit that you, there's a, there's how far you can go uh, with financial inclusion with the existing physical infrastructure. But when you have more people that have mobile phones, and you, the, the cost of smartphones are beginning to come down. This now becomes a very, very big opportunity for us to push that financial inclusion out. Like people are already very confident, confident with phones. They trust their phone, they trust their mobile. And also with the fact that, you know, and we're trying to put more, um, shall I say, security around those mobile phones by insisting that people have a, one an NIN, they have SIM registration. It means that identity and access to a device that can include you financially be, um, becomes a, a better opportunity than physical cash, which is very cost, very costly and very hard to scale down and uh, down um, down to the bottom of the, of the pyramid. So this definitely, I believe, if executed and if we have a good framework, because planning is everything, 
would push that financial inclusion further yeah. down the chain. Uh, all right, let me quickly bring in Apology into the conversation. Uh, Apology, uh, so, so this is coming at a, at a time where, of course, we've had so many, or we have so many cryptocurrencies, you know, flowing in the market. Uh, what is going to be the survival um, uh, percentage now of the e-Naira when it eventually comes? Is it, going to be a, is it going to be in competition with the cryptocurrencies we have at the moment, or it's going to survive on its own? I mean, the Naira is a Naira, whether it's in electronic form or it's in paper form. Uh, the value will always be the value. Uh, currently, it's falling against the dollar. Uh, while cryptocurrencies are, uh, you know, on average, uh, making a return of 200% gain annually. So they're definitely not in the same class. Uh, all right, so uh, obviously Nigeria is following um, in the steps of um, many others. Uh, what do you think would have been the, the, the reason behind the U-turn by the CBN? I mean, uh, I know you've been attending some stakeholder uh, meetings and, and all of that. What was it what, that was seen that has resulted in this decision? Well, it's definitely the way to go. Money has always evolved. Um, and we know now globally... Uh, the digital economy is getting way bigger, uh, is gradually bigger than the uh, traditional economy. Uh, so you have e-commerce giants like Amazon uh, in the U.S. And the, uh, similarly, we have Jumia here. Uh, and you have companies like uh, Sparkle uh, also coming up. And uh, so that's a good thing. Uh, so we need to evolve uh, the monetary system. And that's, that's what's gonna happen. Uh, the, the advent of blockchain technology, which was uh, pretty much an innovation by Satoshi Nakamoto when he created Bitcoin is what is obviously uh, has led to this. So uh, we would have to adopt uh, the technology, otherwise we'll be left behind. Uh, so, would uh, would um, the, are you are you are you privy to the kind of technology that the e currency will be running on? Um, I, I believe it's the Hyperledger Fabric, which is uh, uh, a blockchain to, uh, variant of the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, and Ethereum, of course, is uh, also a, a cryptocurrency, uh, but of course, it has a whole lot more and whistles for enterprise uh, to allow companies or institutions or even government to operate like a permissioned uh, blockchain network as opposed to a permissionless blockchain network like you find with Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, all right, so let's um, uh, let's uh, take a look at um, uh, some of these uh, countries that have already um, uh, pretty much uh, adopted the use of e-currencies. That's according to Geoeconomics. Uh, so they say the uh, the Bahamas, the Saint Kitts and Nevis, Antigua, and Barbuda, Saint Lucia, and Grenada are some of the countries that already have um, uh, the the e-currencies in place. Uh, are there any similarities with Nigeria, or perhaps in terms of how it's going to work? Um, uh, what do you see? Is there any connection anywhere? I, I mean, it's. Uh, we, 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 I think the best thing is just to follow the leader. Uh, that would be the best motto. And 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 in terms of best practices and what's working and what's not working, uh, identify them and and you know do SWOT analyses and and try to uh, implement this as soon as possible. So it just doesn't become. Uh, a story we, 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 we talk about until there's a change of guards uh, at CBN and then they're starting from scratch. So hopefully they'll get it off on time. All right, let me uh, bring in Ozoma again back to the conversation. Ozoma, so one of the things that uh, people, a lot of people would even be uh, very much concerned about, you made mention of that earlier on, now, you know, talking about securities. Uh, sometimes, I mean, uh, we've heard so many cases, you know, of uh, business email compromises, uh, you know, password compromises and all of that. Some of us are even careless with our phones. Um, uh, so what are we going to be looking at, you know? when it comes to this, when this uh, fully takes effect, how would you be recommending that people should, you know, uh, keep themselves safe from uh, cyber attacks and also um, uh, cyber hacks as well? 
uh, um, and that's an interesting question. And I, I, I always say with, I'm like, with the evolution of anything or change, there's risk changes. So if you're moving from you know, cash to digital, there's going to be a risk change as well. And so, especially as you know, all the uh, your criminals are also going to move from cash to, to, to cyber. Now, it means that what are those things that, that you're going to need to mitigate? And first of all, it's just keeping and um, making sure that, I mean, first of all, most, most crimes, whether they are physical or digital, are insider jobs. So making sure that, first of all, that people that, and a lot of they have to be a lot of education around security, passwords, how you, where you keep information, the strictness, you know, and also following structures and process. So you know, and the most important thing is, once you know where, who has moved around any infrastructure, and that's any infrastructure, it actually deters, deters people who try to crime. It is where there are gaps. And that's why the move from cash, for example, to the digital is a great thing because it just increases transparency. The more information that is available as to who came here, what did they do, how did they do it, who would you change passwords, that increases transparency, that reduces, reduces um, operational, operational risk. So the most important thing is creating awareness, educating people, around these are, the, these are the benefits, but these are the downsides if you don't do that. And it's just like your checkbook. If you leave your checkbook out and somebody can forge your signature, they'll take your checkbook and use it. If you leave your, your wallet lying carelessly in, a, in an O1 bed or a party, somebody will take your wallet and collect your cash and collect your card as well. And God forbid that they have your password, your money is gone. And if this is not digital, this is just making sure you're keeping things secure. But we're moving from physical security to digital security, and what needs to go with that is a lot of education around very basic, basic education and a lot of awareness. And I think that's what um, we banks are trying to do as well. We know that if we don't continue to tell people about password changes, how people are trying to get people, get how people try to get your passwords password in different ways, even in behavioral ways, when you're distracted or when you're in a position where you're not thinking about security and the they take one bit of information, the information from you, which is what they need to now infiltrate your, your, your network. So education awareness is very, very it's going to be very key. And it's just like moving, even moving people from existing systems to if digital, if this e-currency is going to be successful, there's going to be a lot of education around that. Why am I moving from using my Visa card payment to this? Why am I even, I mean, what's the difference between um, a, a central bank backed currency versus blockchain? Uh, sorry, uh, Bitcoin, because there is still a lot of, you know, concerns and um, unknown about what blockchain is for. Is it is it a tool for transaction? Is it a tool yeah. for? Is it a sorry a platform for investment? So a lot of education is going to, um, an awareness is going to be needed for this to be successful. Uh, talking also, about it, I didn't get you. You were trying to say something. So I, I said a lot of education because trust is very very key. All right, so I was I was. Okay, I was going to say, I mean, you know, as part of that education, it's also going to be as uh, one of the things that people would need to be educated on is how they would be able to use the currency, I mean, the e-currency now, so to speak. Um, how do we go about doing that? Then again, I can't, you know, I, so like then again, I mean, um, we don't have, a, I don't have, a, I, haven't seen, I haven't seen anything, I don't have the amount of details, I don't know how, but how it's going to be scaled, how people are going to convert that cash to digital, how they're going to, how that digital liquidity is going to evolve down to the bottom of the pyramid and what devices or what application are going to be used to do that, how easy it is going to, 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 to change. All, the, all that is not there because that will also form part of the education. That will also form part of that, okay, I trust this. It is transparent. It is clear. It is simple. It's easy for me to do. The cost of moving from this to this is not. Right. The benefit of using this is actually good and I can see the benefits. That's, so those things, I mean, I think it's still early days here, and I, I think a lot of, it, there's, there's more information that we don't have to tell you how this is, how successful this is going to be, how long it's going to take for 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50% of the population or the adult population to, All right. to access uh this. Uh, all right, just hold your thoughts um, as well as Bolaji. We'll take a quick break. And of course, when we come back, we'll still um, take a more look into how this will be used and accessed by everyone when the time comes. Please stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. 
Thank you for staying with us. We still have with us our panelists who are joining us via Zoom from Lagos. Uh, we have uh, Uzoma Dozie as well as Bolaji Onibudu. But just before we went on break, um, Uzoma was talking a little bit about how the, uh, the e-currency of the CBN will be used and accessed by um, Nigerians when the time comes. But um, uh, let me quickly switch again to um, Bolaji also to give us his own perspective as to how he thinks this would be ac uh, accessible by Nigerians when the time comes. Um, I think that uh, majority of Nigerians are already familiar with uh, USSD banking, mm -hmm. mobile payments, mobile banking. So really um, the transition shouldn't be that difficult. But if I, 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 I must say, though, we, the, the, the mode of implementation needs to, they must take uh, uh, consideration of uh, issues to do with uh, wallet, yeah, uh, seed phrases, and passwords. I think it will be in the best interest of both, um, you know, consumers and financial institutions and the central bank to ensure that the banks always have a pivotal role whereby they are able to provide custodial services of some sort so that uh, the key, uh, the, the password and, 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 you know, usernames being lost and stolen can easily be recovered or reset where the actual uh, Naira resides uh, with the custodians like the banks. So this way, the issues that are often common or, or pertinent with the cryptocurrencies are not carried over. So that's, that's the point I'd like to make in addition. Uh, so, I mean, as it is now, Nigeria is not the only country uh, that is about to launch, um, you know, e-currencies. We also have um, Senegal, we have um, Ghana, South Africa, um, I think um, Togo and uh, a few of um, some other con African countries that also are also looking you know, to join the global wave. Um, again, like you said earlier on, it's, uh, it's a moving train that everyone must be on. So it seems everyone is kind of you know, trying to buy his ticket. Um, but as it is now, I mean, with all of them also you know, trying, to, trying to adopt this, uh, it means it's going to be a bigger, it's going to be a bigger chain. How, is, there, is there any form of collaboration for this between all of the countries in Africa, at least for now, that are you know, trying to be on this um, train? What form of collaboration do you think can be in place to ensure that you know, this transition or this, the acceptance of this e-currency you know, happens seamless and smoothly? I mean, uh, in terms of collaboration, I would uh, caution against that just because projects within public sectors are just well known to take time to experience delays and, you know, lots of approval processes, stages from ministry to agency to, you know, and, and um, we just don't want to make it more complicated. I think uh, from 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 if if I were was overseeing such a project, I would ensure that uh, perhaps resources or stakeholders that are part of the project are experienced, you know, either from any of these uh, jurisdictions that you've mentioned, and of course the the vendor, you know, the technology vendor, also is experienced, so they can bring in their their body of knowledge and experience to 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 make the project fruitful. Uh, as opposed to trying to collaborate with uh, another government. Because I know a case in Canada, for five years, they've been trying to implement this. And there's always a change in the head of the project or uh, some level change in government, uh, new approval processes or new team. And then they have to start all over, start all over, start all over. It's just red tape. Uh, we, you want to get rid of that as much as possible. All right. Um, uh, let's let's see how that plays out. But uh, let me uh, also bring in uh, Uzoma uh, to get his take on collaborations and you know all this kind of um, movements. You know when it comes to this, because we've seen uh, situations where, like you made mention earlier on, of uh, maybe like the Alibaba's, you know, the Amazons. You know how they collaborate and you know have uh, people like the Jumiers and and the other um, e-commerce companies that we have here. I mean. Is this something that can be replicated in this in this instance? Okay, I'm, you know, I'm going to tell the same line as Polaji. I'm going to tell a different perspective and say that, you know, you know, like just like on an airplane, when you go on a plane and the, the um, uh, attendant, before you fly, they tell you, you know, in the case of an emergency, oxygen, oxygen mass will drop. Please look after yourself before you look after somebody else. And that's actually the case here. 
Nigeria's problems are I mean, like our payments. So like every country has different, there are different stages of payments in their state and they have different stakeholders. And these stakeholders are all interlinked. So you have your payments, the existing payment system, they try to introduce another one. How does it fit in? Is it complementary? Is it actually going to um, take over something else? You also have the players in the industry. You have the level of indication or stickiness of customers and what they're actually using. Then you have legislation. So where collaboration needs to be is not um, outside the country. It is identifying who the stakeholders are in, the, in, your, in Nigeria. What level, where are we, what additional infrastructure do we need? What new legislation do we need? How do we amend uh, legislation and regulation to ensure there's minimum disruption and there's wide scale adoption of this new system that we think that we, we, we should be beneficial? So where the collaboration is going to come, come in is actually the different arms and different stakeholders in the Nigerian market right, to ensure that this is successful. Yeah, that's correct. Our apology seems to also um, agree with you. At least uh, you both kind of agree on this one, you know, uh, when it comes to collaborations and all of that. But I'd have to say thank you. I mean, it's a continuing conversation. Uh, of course, uh, when the time comes again, we'll come back and look at it uh, by the time it would have launched and Nigerians are already getting acquainted with the um, uh, e-currency. But I have to say thank you to both of you. Uh, Balaji Onibudo, CEO and founder of Zenbit, as well as Uzoma Duzie, CEO and founder of Sparkle. It was a pleasure having this chat with you both. Thank you, Victor. Right, thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Well, that's uh, where we are with the e-currency, but let's take a look at the most viewed videos on our YouTube channel in the past week. The explanation by presidential media aide on the president's numerous medical trips abroad begins this week's most viewed videos in fifth place. When this summit came up, the president felt, why not kill two beds with one stone? Instead of traveling for a routine <coughs> medical checkup, coming back and then coming for this summit, why not wait and combine both? And that's why. Both are being Deputy Commissioner of Police, Abba Kiari, has... It's followed by a daily recap of stories by Channel's television, headlined by the denial by DCP Abba Kiari that he received money from Hosh Poppy. In third is a riot act by the Chief of Defence Staff to those who want to be violent in the country. What makes the South East very peculiar is the current agitations to which my view good number of those who are in support of such organizations have a wrong understanding as to the realities on ground. Second sees a reunited Plantation Boys performance at an event organized to pay tribute to the late Sound Sultan. <laughs> While the reaction that trolled the failure of the DSS to produce Namdi Kanu to court by his lawyer and former governor tops this week's chart in first place. How they handle this case will now determine how the world sees the judicial of the And that's it. Those were the most viewed videos on our YouTube channel in the past week and also where we dropped the anchor today on the program. I'm Victor Mathias. Thank you for watching.